so you might be wondering why I'm running a Q-tip over this 46 logic board. After all, N Commander, don't you mostly work with software? Well, yes, but this system was given to me by a friend and represents my first attempts at hardware restoration and vintage data recovery. Now, I do want to mention this in advance that I did make some mistakes in this project, so this video serves as both an overview of my efforts and also a warning of what not to do and what I should have done in hindsight. At the risk of spoilers, I will note that this system, at the time of writing, is partially working and I didn't cause any permanent damage. Let's backtrack a bit. This is the system as I originally got it, and it's an Intel Professional Workstation 486, a pizza box type desktop computer with surprisingly high-end equipment for its era. There isn't a lot of information online about these systems, but Intel seems to have sold them from 1991 to 1993. While Intel is primarily known for making processors, they did have a small line of computers for sale which were a combination of both reference platforms and speciality hardware. This becomes pretty clear when we flip it around to the back. I'll let past me describe in detail. All right, let's take a look at the back of this machine and see what we've got working, because there's some unusual things about this machine. Here on the back, we've got two serial ports, a parallel port, and then unusually we have actually a SCSI adapter, which is not typically found on most pizza box or low-end machines. So this suggests this is some sort of workstation machine. Then we got two PS2 ports, a VGA adapter, integrated Ethernet, and an AUI adapter. Obviously a sound card of some sort has been added and we have an empty slot here. So opening this system up, there's even more things inside. The top basically just slides off. With the case off, we can see some more oddities. Inside this metal caddy, we can both see the floppy drive and the hard drive made by digital. Given what we saw in the back, it should be unsurprising that this is a SCSI hard drive. To the left, we have the card slots sitting off this riser board. It may not be clear from the video, but these are ESA slots. For those not familiar, ESA, standing for Extended ISA, was a backwards compatible extension to the original ISA slots found in early PCs. In general, ESA slots are only found in servers and workstation computers. Past me is going to keep disassembling this system to look for problems, but eagle-eyed viewers may have noticed one right off the bat. This system has a Dallas time chip. I'll talk about why these are a problem later, but Dallas chips are notorious for failing for one simple reason. They have an integrated battery which cannot be trivially replaced. These things are a giant pain, but thankfully, this specific chip is already socketed, so I will not need to break out the soldering iron. The next headache is this non-standard power supply unit. It just sort of slots against the main board, and it has a 20-pin connector. That doesn't correspond to any of the standard PC-PSU connectors that I'm aware of. As I would find out, this power supply is pretty much unique to this system, but I'm getting ahead of myself. This is a good time to talk about why I have this system. Originally, I needed a system of this vintage to help test Banyan Vines 5.0 and to help resolve an issue I had in reverse engineering and bypassing its copy protection dongles. My friend said I could have this 486 on the condition that I dumped the hard drive for him. Unfortunately, this specific machine cannot accept a 5 and a quarter inch drive, so it's useless for my Vines work. That being said, I still wanted to help my friend, and I found the system interesting enough to document. To be honest though, I'm not really that much of a hardware guy. While I do know how to solder, I will fully admit that I am definitely out of my wheelhouse with this project. That being said, a large part of vintage computing involves the hardware part, so I figured I should learn. With the main board out, it was time to inspect it for leaking caps and other damages. It's hard to see it on camera, but there's a fine layer of muck coating everything, and frankly, I wanted to clean this board thoroughly before attempting to power it on. I know other people have had success with running things through a dishwasher, but I'm really not comfortable with that. This board has factory installed bodge wires, and I felt that a much more delicate touch was called for. There's nothing left to do but put some elbow grease into it, so let's cue the music and break out the time lapse.
Okay, that took a while, but it was totally worth it. After that thorough cleaning and examination, I am happy to say that I did not find any bulging or leaking capacitors, so I'm reasonably confident that this is safe to power up. That being said, I felt like checking the PSU was a prudent move before going further. Before going into what I found, I'm going to prefix this with a warning. If you do not know what you're doing, you should never open up and work on a power supply unit. Mains voltage is not something to mess around with, and capacitors can retain a charge for an extended period even if disconnected. With that disclaimer aside, let's get to it. Just from examination, I can tell you that someone else has been in here. There are screws missing. Beyond that though, it did not take too much to disassemble the PSU. My first surprise was the PC speaker flopping around when I opened the case. In truth, the speaker is actually bolted by a screw on the exterior shell, but this wasn't evident at first. Frankly though, the whole thing just left me flabbergasted. I have never seen a PC speaker inside a PSU, and I cannot imagine what drove this design decision. It's not like there isn't room in the main case. Even when properly mounted, the speaker sits very close to an unshielded inductor. It would not take much to cause this whole thing to short out. Beyond that, this PSU is very tightly packed, and there are plastic inserts to prevent components from touching. I just got this feeling that this is not a well-designed piece of hardware. The only relief that I saw is that there's a fuse to protect against catastrophic failure and a lack of reefa capacitors. The entire PSU was caked with dust and grime, and I spent more time trying to get all the crud out of it. In truth, I would have liked to remove the case entirely, and I did disassemble most of the PSU in an attempt to do so, but I ran into a major problem. Because of how tightly packed the PSU was, to take the main board out, I would have to remove the plug mounts. In theory, this should have been fairly straightforward if they weren't being held in place with two strip screws in an awkward location. Despite my best efforts, I could not get the screws to release, and given their condition, I suspect it will take some serious effort to get them out. I'll reach out to the Vintage Computer Forum and other experts to see if I can get any good advice on how to remove them. The good news though is that all the capacitors, as best I can tell, were in good condition and I did not see any leakage. Given that this power supply has a proper fuse, I was reasonably confident that even if a capacitor fails and shorts, it wasn't going to fry the logic board. My thought process is that if this PSU dies, it's likely safer and saner to rig an adapter to a modern power supply than it is to try and rehabilitate this one. If you've got any good advice on either the stripped screws or how to handle a potential PSU replacement, I'd like to hear them below. At this point though, it's time to reassemble, and that's where I made a nearly critical mistake. At the top of the PSU, there are three connectors for where the PC speaker and the two case fans attach. During my aborted attempt at disassembly, I had disconnected these wires from the main circuit board, and rather stupidly, I did not take a picture or properly mark them, nor were there any markings on the board to say which were which. This was a real problem because some fans run an AC main voltage, and I was certain to blow something up if that was the case. Since I couldn't remove the main board, I couldn't follow the traces to know for sure. Furthermore, I wasn't going to try and connect a multimeter inside a live PSU to measure voltages. Let this be a lesson to any would-be restorer. Carefully mark and document how things come apart if you have any intention of putting them back together again. For future projects, I'm going to make sure I take a lot of dedicated still photos and attach labels to prevent this from happening again. I was slightly panicked due to this snafu, but then I got a lucky break. Upon a close examination, I noticed that there was a label for the PSU grills, and I could just make out the words 12VDC on one of the fans. That told me that these were DC powered fans and not AC. If that was the case, a misconnection was not necessarily catastrophic. In hindsight, the smart thing to do would have been simply connect the fans one by one and then use that to determine the proper connections. That way, I would not have risked accidentally blowing out the PC speaker through over voltage. I will fully admit that I could have done better here, but this entire project has been a learning experience to say the least. With the PSU reassembled, it was time for a smoke test. That ain't right. That definitely ain't right.
Well, the good news was that there wasn't a popping noise, fire, or distinct odor of magic smoke. The whining sound was being caused by the fan voltages being sent to the PC speaker, and in truth, I had some trouble hearing it. I thought one of the fans was grinding before I realized what had happened. I ended up bleeding the PSU capacitors and swapping the leads around, which solved the issue. At this point, I would have liked to measure the voltages coming out of the PSU, but it seemed like a really bad idea to jam multimeter leads into a PSU socket blindly. PassMe is going to start reassembling the system, and while we do so, I'm going to talk about another in hindsight moment. Without a schematic, I cannot definitively say which each pin of the PSU provided what, but there was a way I could determine both ground and the DC voltages without risk to myself. PCs generally run on a combination of both positive and negative 5 and 12 volts, and there are several points on the board where I should have been able to find those voltages, such as at the card slots. Armed with that knowledge, I could have potentially reverse engineered the power pin out. Regardless, with the reassembly complete, it was time for a proper smoke test. I've moved the system to my desk, and I'm using this modern LCD as a display since it has a VGA input. For this first drive, I'm going to leave the disk caddy disconnected since if it blows, at least the hard drive will survive. Here goes nothing. Well, it's time for a smoke test. That's a good sign. Oh, we got BIOS codes. Well, it didn't explode, which I'll call a win given everything up to this point. As expected, we get a postcode about the real-time clock being dead, and then the system hangs trying to initialize the SCSI bus. This is entirely expected because the bus isn't terminated, so it's time to put the disk caddy in and see if it boots. That was a somewhat better result, but it quickly becomes apparent that this system is not healthy. First, we get a new message that the ESA configuration is invalid, followed by DAWs hanging when HiMem tries to test extended memory. By pressing F8 on startup and skipping HiMem and autoexec.bat, I managed to get dumped to a C prompt. I was a little concerned about the memory test hang, although I did find it rather strange that the BIOS memory test passed while the DAWs based one failed. It wasn't something I was going to immediately concern myself with though since my first goal was to dump the file system in some form. My big hope here was that since this system had onboard Ethernet, there was a good chance that there was some form of networking software pre-installed, and here I struck pay dirt. NetWare's ODI client was present. Given my prior NetWare experiences, this seemed like a quick and easy solution to getting the files out. Unfortunately, the LP486E driver would not load, complaining of invalid configuration. We already knew that we had a problem here, so it was time to solve it. I have never owned or used an ISA system before, so I didn't know what to expect, but the first place I thought to look was in the setup screens. There, I could see options relating to the onboard LAN controller, but none of the changes I made would persist across a reboot. I've already alluded to the cause, but it's at this point that we need to loop back to the Dallas time chip I talked about earlier. Besides providing a real-time clock, the Dallas chip also provides a small amount of persistent storage, approximately 50 bytes worth, which can be used to save system settings. With the chip's built-in battery dead as a doornail, the system simply cannot save its configuration. The specific Dallas chip in this system, the DS1287, is no longer manufactured, and the odds are that any I got off eBay would also have dead batteries. There are two known solutions to this problem. The first is to use a Dremel to carefully cut the size of the chip and attach a replacement battery. To be honest, I'm not exactly thrilled at the idea of doing this, so this option is what I would call last resort. The second is to use a modern replacement. Maximum Integrated makes the DS1288-7+, which is supposedly a drop-in replacement for the DS1287. While researching this, I've seen somewhat differing reports of success on replacing the Dallas chips with more modern parts. 
Still, at $10 each, they're cheap enough to take a chance on, so I have ordered two replacements from DigiKey. Beyond that, I've also ordered a few odds and ends to help me dump the file system even if I can't go further than this. To be honest, I actually did a lot more experimentation with the system even after hitting the stumbling block, but we're out of time on this video. If you want to continue to follow my computing adventures, do me a favor and leave a like and hit that subscribe button. It really does make a huge difference for myself and the channel. Beyond that, as usual, I can be found on Twitter and Discord if you want to follow my adventures in real time. Until the next time, this is N Commander, signing off. Have a great day.